I've been around and I'm experienced And I've lived my life to the full But I can't explain what's happening to me Though I sure can feel the pull And welcome to an edition of Globetrotting with Gillespie. Yes, me, Dana Gillespie, here on the sofa at the Temple of Art and Music. And of course, that's affectionately known as the TAM. And it's this amazing, it's the coolest, hippest venue in town because it's got 38 pianos in it. It's totally bonkers with art everywhere and really interesting guests. So I'd like you to meet the next guest and he's, he's also involved with art and music and we're going to find out why and what, how and when and everything else. Please welcome Martin Green. Yay! Hi. So now, Martin, I want to know exactly your connection with music and art. Can you kind of let us, let us in on the secret? Well, I've been passionate uh, about music for a long time and, um, and collecting records. That's what I've always done. And, uh, and I was always very interested in film music and kind of oddities. And uh, during the late 80s and into the 90s, when uh, records became unfashionable, because everything went on to CD, you could find records everywhere very cheap, in every junk shop, charity shop, yes. piles and piles and piles of them, 10p, 5p, 50p. And I just used to go around finding all these kind of unusual records. So you're a vinyl junkie. Big vinyl junkie. And There's then... about 4,000 of them sitting around <laughs> here, by the way. There's a massive oh, collection. Oh, you shouldn't have told me well, that. Well, you I'll better be... speak to the boss man in a while. He's a I'll real... I'll be rooting yeah. them out. <laughs> so, yeah, so you go and pick them up for 10p. I'd find them for 10p. Then I ran a club in the 90s called Smashing, and um, I used to DJ them at the club, and people would start to get an interest in this kind of music, a lot of lounge music, easy listening music, um, music from the 60s, kind of forgotten music from the 60s and the 70s, and a, a scene it developed around these kind of records. And, um, and then I started to release them. Really? You could release them because they'd run out of their copyright or something? Well, no, or... What, what happened, actually, I was playing one track at my club and it's called Black Right by Mandingo, uh, produced by Norman Newell. Oh, I remember. I met him. Oh, really? Really good mate of Lionel Bart. Oh, wow, Yes, he fantastic. was a lovely fellow. Oh, wow, yeah, excellent. Yeah, anyway. And I was playing this, and everyone was going wild. It was a big kind of tribal orchestral number. And a friend came running up and said, what is this track? This is amazing, it's amazing. And this friend was Tris Penner. And um, Tris Penner was working at EMI, and... Um, he says, and I said, it's one of yours, it's in the EMI track. And he said, really? And I said, yeah. So he said, come in see me in the office next week. So we went in and we, and we started to put together the idea of an album, which, which, which is called The Sound Gallery. And it was a collection of these kind of obscure records from the EMI vault. And we put it together and Tris was brilliant where he, because uh, uh, he persuaded EMI, because EMI was saying, what do you want to release this music for? No one bought it the first time round. <laughs> and he said, no, there's a scene, I've got faith in it. And he was brilliant. And he pushed for this album to be released and on double vinyl. We mastered it at Abbey Road from the original master tapes, because uh, he said he wants it to be like the Rolls Royce of compilations. And it came out and it was enormous. We sold 100,000 copies. Was it from something, Mandingo? Was it from a film? It was, from, was, a, just it a... was from an album called Mandingo, um, um, Primeval Music of Life. And, um, <laughs> and they did a series. It was like a concept, orchestral concept yeah. album. And basically the whole Easy Listening Lounge movement all exploded from this album we put together. I'm so pleased because, I, you know, of course, I started recording in the 60s, yeah. mid-60s and in, obviously carried on ever since. And I often feel that so much of that music has got, has got, kind of got lost in the ether. People don't seem that interested. But, yes, I've been well, proved they, wrong. Uh, well, they are. People are interested. They but can't get the, it, though, But it's can getting they? that relationship with the people that have got access to those master tapes and all those... Yeah. And, um, and that's why Tris was so brilliant when he was at EMI, because he, had, he was such a fan and knew, where, where is that? Where can we find that? And, so, and, I, and um, 
Uh, so then, uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of compilations with music that's um, in the public domain, which is pre-1962. So then it's kind of easier to, um, uh, to put that work out. Uh, yeah, that's a sort of a, a quite a controversial subject, because in a couple of years, I'm going to be pre... I mean, <laughs> you know, domain. I'll be in the public domain, because <laughs> I think my first single was in 64 or 65. Oh. So it's... Any, any minute now. Well, it's been extended, I think. I think the, the, the time it has been extended a bit. But it's. But I know what you, what you mean. The, the, what, for me, it's great because I can put out music or the, the companies that I work for can yeah. put out music that would otherwise disappear. And well, I'm I, pleased. And I think it's great that, 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 um, that, that artists can, um, can have their work heard Although they're probably dead by now, let's some face are, some it. Some aren't, though. Really? You know, some aren't, yeah. I think this public domain thing was so short in the old days because no, nobody thought anybody <laughs> no, would live no, that exactly. long. And if you were recording, you definitely mm. wouldn't be around still doing it 50 years later. What, it's 70 years now, isn't it's 70, it? It was 50. Yeah. Now it's 70, yeah. So, um... And then if, when you put your compilation album together... Yeah. How can people find them? How do they get them? I, I, um, is it on a label? Your own label? No, 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 no. I work just... for different people. There's a okay. record company called Trunk Records. Okay. I've worked for Cherry Red. Me Ace. too. Yes. Me so, too. Oh, great. Well, I've been on Ace since 1980. Oh, and Cherry fantastic. Red just re-released all the stuff I did in the main man, the Bowie years. Oh. And thanks to Tris, I think he found it in some... Locker room somewhere. <laughs> well, I don't know where you found it, but he found two versions of the song that Bowie wrote for me, Andy Warhol, oh, which yeah. is sort of demos with Bowie on guitar and Mick Ronson, I think, on bass. But had it not been for Tris, it wouldn't have been on the Cherry Red thing, which I think they just oh. re-released it again as of a few weeks it's ago. It's a great track. Fantastic. Well, it's it's not a <laughs> it's not a bad track. I wish I'd written it myself. <laughs> Although, frankly, the words Andy Warhol have always left me a bit kind of oh. funny. Well, well, I've, because I so I DJ. So also, not only put, put these um, albums together, I DJ and put them so I play them to an audience. But because mm. of lockdown, I haven't been able to do that. Yeah. So I've been finding tracks and putting them on Instagram. So I've got a big Instagram following. And uh, one of the tracks I found, uh, what I wanted to put up, was Andy Warhol, your version, right. with a fantastic video. Um, am I wearing... People went crazy about it. Am I wearing a sort of gold corset with a sort of pink f bit of dress? Yeah, and it's different kind of colours. It's kind of quite sort of soup, souped-up colours. Yeah, you know, they always erroneously said that it was made for Top of the Pops. It wasn't. Oh. It was made for... Some television show in Holland, mm. and the gold corsety thing with which you have to sort of <laughs> pull yourself in mm. and lift them up was made by um, Natasha Corniloff, who did all of Bowie's oh, outfits, really? and she oh. did all of mine. Pushed, of course, by Angie Bowie, yeah. ex-wife of yeah. Bowie's, because, because Angie was very keen on fashion, oh. as was David. But actually, Angie. Pushed, pushed him into him more, yeah. and found all these connections, it's, but um, it's a fantastic video. Yeah, it's not bad. Although I, when I look at it, <laughs> I keep thinking I look a bit kind of cold and stiff. But I mean, I was so young then, you know. I suppose it was recorded in '73. I think the um, al the album was. Well, so. when I posted it. Loads of people said, "Oh my God, this is fantastic! This is the video is amazing. You look amazing. The song's great." And a lot of people started reposting it, including John Mabry, who's a big film director. He saw it and said, "Oh, this is fantastic!" And he reposted it on his yes! Instagram, and Good. It, it got an enormous following. Well, fame at last, maybe <laughs> for me. I've always felt a bit awkward about the lyrics, though, because it's very odd lyrics. Yes. Yeah. But tell me, that's mm. the music side, yeah. and so that's what you do. Is that your biggest passion? But I know that's you have a a, passion. And another then, art, seeing then, as we're surrounded yeah. by paintings. Well, I, well the, the approach really was basically similar to what happened with uh, the sound gallery in Tris. Um, I um, went to an exhibition at the uh, V&A about postmodernism, and. A friend of mine is an artist uh, who died, died very recently, very sadly, called Dougie Fields. Oh, yeah, no, him, and, knew him. And uh, he was a wonderful artist. And I was expecting to... This was about eight, about nine years ago. And I was expecting to see his work at this exhibition because was, his work kind of epitomised postmodernism. And um, he wasn't there. 
and I was very disappointed and quite angry. So a, f- a friend of mine that I w- was at the exhibition with, uh, called James Lawler, was working out of a gallery in Liverpool. And I said, we should put a Dougie Fields exhibition together, which we did. And um, it was his first solo show in 25 years. How long ago was this? About nine years ago. And so eight, he was still alive? Mm, yeah, okay. he only passed away a few months yeah. ago. Yeah. And um, it got a lot of interest in him, and you know, and 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 since he really, you know, started to get a lot more interest, and um, and I thought, well, you know, like I did with music, I think there's this sort of talent that just sort of falls through the cracks, mm-hmm. and it's got nothing to do with talent or brilliance or originality. It's just they're not quite in fashion, and. Um, like Dougie, like because kind of painting kind of went out of fashion. Everything went kind of went conceptual, and so things just so people just kind of slipped through the cracks. So we did the Dougie show, and that was a big success. And then we did the show with Andrew Logan, another um, uh, well known, who's brilliant. Yes, but they never get into the Tate, and they never get into these sort of places. But then after the show we did, Dougie did have a show at the uh, had a painting in the V&A as part of the Pink Floyd exhibition. He had a painting of Sid Barrett. So. I th- so I believe it's important to give these older, kind of neglected creatives an opportunity to show work. And because also a lot of kids come along, when they saw the D- Dougie paintings, we had a lot of students coming along, and Dougie's paintings are big paintings. Yeah. And they were saying, oh, this is amazing, who paints them? We said, Dougie Fields. I said, really? But he was he, such a well-known well, name. He paints all of it, yeah. and he said, yes, every bit of it. <laughs> and they said, oh, well, he hasn't got people doing it for him. No. He paints it all, and they were, and they were inspired by him. Yeah. So, and I, and I think it's important that that kind of conversation happens, and that, that inspiration happens between older and younger creative people. Well, I'm very pleased that you say <laughs> this because I lived for 38 years with somebody who fell through the cracks, but he died last uh, year. But very famous painter in Vienna called Jörg Huber, uh, and I had the best album covers for years because <laughs> he did them yeah. always. But he, I don't know who I'm going to find now to do all my album covers because he's he's no more. But these painters that were amazing, people just I guess it's all computer generated now. Well, what's happening is. Um, I, I, I just seem to have a kind of natural feel, uh, that a lot of my friends do as well, which you think, this is going to start happening soon, or this is going to start happening soon. It's like what we did with, with Chris with the album. And um, painting's the same. So when we've started showing painters, no-one was interested. Now everyone's interested in painting. So people want to buy painters. And, and one of the painters um, that we've shown recently is um, uh, Caroline Kuhn. Right, and yeah, well, all, um, she was the, um, you know, the, what I can't, you know, when, when you got, release. Release, if was you Caroline, got, if you yeah. Got, if you got nicked for your drugs, <laughs> you went to release. <laughs> yeah. And was it Richard Neville was the one that held uh, the, the... Yes, yeah. Yeah. With Oz. Yeah. Oz, indeed. Felix so, Dennis. So Caroline um, was a friend of... Dougie said, when we did Dougie's show, he said, you should look at Caroline's work. So we went to Caroline's and... Um, and put a show together with her. It was her first ever show. She'd never shown any work before. And she just had this house, little house, full of paintings. And absolutely fantastic paintings. And um, so, you know, she actually, she was in her early 70s, 73 at the time, and she put all her paints away and she was going to throw everything away. She was so despondent. And we offered her this show in Liverpool. And... Uh, we did the show, and it went really well, and then it got picked up by an artist called Peter Doig, who's very successful, and we showed it with him in his gallery in London, and now she's um, just, the Tate have just bought a couple of paintings, Great. she's going to show something in the Haywood, and it's great, and at 76, she's starting to get the recognition that she deserves, because she's brilliant. So I do believe they're just people around that have got incredible talent, and they just sort of, they just need to be put up there. Well, you also do a radio show, don't you? Yes, with Beige Green Room on Soho Radio. Why is it called that, Beige uh, Green? I, I do it with a guy called Lenny Beige. 
who's a performer. Oh, right, the, the yes. I think show. I've heard, strangely enough, I heard about him today. Oh. Um, because somebody called uh, uh, Lana Pile. Oh, yes. I don't know if you know. Lana's Lana. been on the show. Yes, guess, Lana's yeah. meant to do it. I think it's tomorrow and asked oh. if I could stand in. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to work. I haven't checked my mobile oh, okay. and I'm not very techno, so oh, I don't okay. look at things okay. too it's often. It's under my love. <laughs> I'm so pleased that you're doing this because, you know, I come from the past. I'm still alive and would like to do know that stuff that you've done in the past gets some recognition one of these days and in the future. there's an audience. And there is an audience. People do respond to it. I think the thing about the past and the sort of past that we look to is um, there was such creativity. And I think because you could, you know, you'd get cheap flats, you could squat, all that, there wasn't that pressure to make money in the way that there is now for people because things are tougher. Um, so people were incredibly creative. Yeah, actually money wasn't the be-all and end-all. No. You didn't sign, you didn't become a, go into the music business to make money. No. You went and, it, well, you'll be lucky if you did. Yeah. You did it because it was a passion and it was within yeah. your heart. And I'm quite despondent when I see the young people saying, well, I want to go in and be a celebrity. Ugh, a celeb, you know, know. You, music should be the god. People were famous. Or art. Yeah, people were famous because they did something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much, Martin, for coming thank you for onto the sofa on. here at the Temple of Art and Music. This place is perfect for it's you. It's a fantastic and, place, isn't Wonderful. it? Just yeah. and I hope you come back and visit when there's some. I will. When I'd you love know, to. when we're doing some concerts. Yeah, will definitely. Martin Green, thank you very much for visiting. <laughs> at the Temple of Art and Music. This is Dana Gillespie saying, tune in next week. There'll be another uh, Globe Trotting with Gillespie. Oh, fuck me. It's hot.